Wichita, Kansas, built on the prairie flats of the Midwest, honest, God-fearing Middle America, the biggest city in the state they call the buckle on the Bible belt, a community where people felt safe leaving their doors unlocked until a serial killer began to prowl the streets. For over 30 years, two generations of detectives hunted Wichita's serial killer. Lieutenant Landwehr headed the BTK task force. We knew sooner or later he will kill again if we fail in our attempt. BTK first struck in 1974. What detectives found at the scene haunted former Chief of Police Richard Lemunyan for decades. This is the house where it all started. This is where BTK made his first hit over 30 years ago. Most of our homicides were the domestic type, the smoking gun, bar fights, things of that nature. But this particular one was highly unusual, took all of us by, uh, by surprise. The wood frame house was home to the Otero family, who had only just moved into the area. Joseph was an Air Force veteran, and his wife Julie worked in the local factory. It was very shocking for the officers when they came up. They found uh, the parents face down in their own bedroom, fully clothed, obviously strangled, uh, bags over their head. The strangled corpse of nine-year-old Joe Jr. was in another bedroom. But police were still to make another horrific discovery. His 11-year-old sister, Josephine. Josephine had been put through a different type of death than the others. He took her downstairs and uh, she was obviously alive. He had put a rope around her neck and over some pipes and he would raise her up and as she was dying and he was masturbating at that time so she was the target the primary target I believe for this the other three Otero children had only escaped because they were at school when the killer attacked the killer had made certain there was no call for help disabling the phone line before entering the house that's what led the investigators to thinking that this couldn't be a random thing. People just don't walk in off the street and murder a family. You couldn't get your mind around that. That didn't happen in Wichita, Kansas. But Wichita was different now. BTK had arrived. January 1974. The Wichita Police Department was searching for the brutal murderer of the Otero family. The victims, a mother, father, and two of their children. All four had been asphyxiated and strangled. Why would someone do this to a family? No one would do this just to go in and do it. There had to be a reason for it. Police thought there could be a sexual motive due to evidence left at the scene. They were focusing on seminal fluid that was deposited near the body of Josephine Otero. They were primarily interested in determining the blood group if possible. Blood typing suggested the killer was blood type O. But that's the commonest type. 40% of people are type O. Before the use of DNA, the test could only narrow down the suspect list so far. For nine months, police followed up every lead they had. Witnesses provided descriptions and identikits were drawn up. Then, in October 1974, three men confessed to murdering the Oteros. But one person knew they were lying. Those three dudes you have in custody are just talking to get publicity for the Otero murders. They know nothing at all. I did it by myself and with no one's help. 
Only the letter's author knew the horrific details. Josephine, hanging by the neck in the northwest part of the basement. Hands tied with bind cord, feet with clothesline cord. Her glasses in the southwest bedroom. Only the killer would know. None of this had been released uh, publicly. FBI profiler Roy Hazelwood has analyzed BTK's behavior. It is unusual for a serial killer to correspond uh, following the commission of a crime. BTK certainly uh, suffered from malignant narcissism. And that's when you begin to consider yourself superior to others, that you're incapable of making mistakes, and you have a desperate need for attention. He had typed this letter, took it to the city library, and then he called one of the local newspaper reporters. BTK craved attention and used his letter to taunt the police. He dared them to catch him before he struck again. When this monster enters my brain, I will never know. Maybe you can stop him. I can't. He has already chosen his next victim. The code words for me will be, bind them, torture them, kill them, B, T, K. They will be on the next victim. He's a psychopath, and a psychopath is a very manipulative individual. He's an individual who manages to compartmentalize. In other words, he can separate out uh, what's taking place from his involvement. Then, nothing for three years. But BTK was preparing to strike again. His next victim lived here, on Hydraulic Street. She was a uh, mother, alone with her children, and she was ill that day. 24-year-old Shirley Vianne was at home with her three children that day. He had what he called a hit kit. He brought his own materials. Rope and duct tape to bind the victim and a gun to force them into submission. At 11.45 a.m., he was ready to strike. He locked the children in the bathroom. He murdered her by strangling her, slowly. Sexual sadism feeds off of the response to the infliction of physical or emotional pain. It's extremely important for BTK to elicit that, that response of terror and fear. Then something happened. He didn't get the phone wire cut. So the phone rang, but it became a panic situation for him. So he left. The investigators came to me and said there's a possibility this is tied to the Otero murders. Something else puzzled the chief. Shirley Vian's son saw the murderer at the door of a neighbor's home earlier in the same day. We never did think that she was the primary target, which turns out she wasn't. Very few people experience in a lifetime being able to say, I was the target of a serial killer, because most people that are targets of serial killers don't live to talk about it. Cheryl Sarkozy and Judy Skirl were roommates back in the late 70s, living just a few doors down from Shirley Vian. But on the day of the murder, the women were out. I came home and the police said that a man had murdered the woman down the street from me, but previous to him murdering her, he had come to my house and knocked on my door. 
So the police believed that I was the intended victim that day. Cheryl had had a lucky escape, but the roommates think BTK came back the following year. And I can remember turning on the kitchen light as I'm entering the room, and I looked up and I saw a man peeking in the back window. And he turned and walked away. And by then we had the phone and we had dove underneath the kitchen table for safety and tried to call the police and waited underneath the kitchen table until the sun came up. BTK targeted neighborhoods where he thought he might find women at home alone. He would troll the area, he would find somebody that looked right to him, and that's how he would target his victims. 25-year-old Nancy Fox lived alone, getting home late from working two jobs. Part of his protection against making mistakes was getting to know his victims, gathering intelligence, where they live, uh, what kind of car they drive, what time they come home. On the 8th of December, 1977, Nancy Fox returned home from her job at a jewelry store. Hi, Nancy. Manual and ligature strangulation hanging. These are very slow and agonizing ways to die. Sure. He did take the victims to the brink of death, let them know that they were at the point of death, and that he allowed them to come back. Tied a little bit tighter. That method of allowing the victim to revive goes to his playing the role of God. He has within his power life and death over another human being. Eight eighteen the following morning, police hear the killer's voice for the first time. Dispatcher. You will find a homicide at eight forty three South Pershing. Nancy Fox. Goes to his narcissism, that need for attention. Here I am, I'm calling you to let you know that I did it and you still can't catch me. South Pershing. Nancy Fox. Police rushed to the call box, but when they got there, the killer was gone. It's part of his power, it's part of his game that he's playing with the police. Two months later, BTK made his next move. A package arrived at this Wichita TV station. It was a package that contained not only a letter, but a poem. And I have a portion of the poem here. It was titled, Oh Death to Nancy. What is this that I see? Cold, icy hands taking hold of me. For death has come, you all can see. Hell has opened up its gate to trick me. And then it's signed BTK. He said, quote, how about some names for me? Well, I like the following. Some names like the, the BTK, BTK Strangler, Strangler the Psycho. Psycho. And then he continues, he says, the Wichita Executioner, the Asphyxiator. The killer claimed to have committed seven murders. The Otero family, Shirley Vianne, Nancy Fox, and one unnamed victim. How many do I have to kill before I get my name in the paper or some national attention? I think it's this line that absolutely stopped everyone in their tracks. BTK's threat to kill again gave police a horrible dilemma. Give the killer the recognition he craved or risk provoking him into another kill. There was a lot of debate in terms of what we should do. Should we give him credit? Should we not give him credit? There's certainly a danger of uh, recognizing the presence of a serial killer within the community and, and particularly giving him a name because now what you've done is you've validated what he's doing. Uh, it may in fact encourage him to commit more murders. But with us right now is Chief of Police Richard Lemonian. But police decided they 